Tom Campbell here. I and MBT Events hope you like this video. It was made possible by donations from our supporters. If you're one of them, thank you so very, very much. If you're new to MBT and find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our Patreon account or through a one-time donation. It would be very much appreciated. The links are in the description below. Thank you. A warm welcome to, to this year's second uh, Q&A uh, for the MBT volunteers together with Tom Campbell and Vanessa, Vanessa Videski. And of course, all our lovely MBT volunteers. My name is Titi Nordjeng and uh, Nathan, uh, that you already know there, <laughs> and I do our best to facilitate and support this lovely community. So this Q&A will give you a unique opportunity to ask Tom about anything you want. It could be personal questions, but it could also be questions around your volunteer work. But we, before we get started, I was thinking that we should open the chat and uh, say hello to each other, but we have sort of warmed up already. So, but we could say a little quick hello there and you may want to share where you're calling from and the temp temperature outside or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, and uh, so I was thinking about that. When you do that, uh, I can also share a little message with our uh, YouTube listeners so that they get the context of what this is. So uh, um, yeah, the, this Q&A is dedicated to the MBT volunteer community. And the work that we do is all about spreading the message about the MBT reality model in various ways. We work with MBT brand identity, social media, web development, video timestamping, project admin, technical development, exploring the concept of conscious computers even, <laughs> and much more. So we currently have quite a few interesting vacancies. Don't we, Nathan? We do, TT. So there's some exciting opportunities to jump in and join the team and support this wonderful work. And actually, the two that I'd like to highlight uh, are represented here by the people who are alive. So for instance, we have here in this call, Michael Sagansky. And Michael is the facilitator for what we're calling the Social Media Nudging Project. And this is an opportunity to, in a very organic way, be a part of different online communities like Discord or Reddit and contribute to those communities just by being who we are. And part of who we are is really enjoying the MBT model. And so in a way, we're getting to share ourselves and MBT simultaneously in different online communities. And as a natural consequence, MBT gets to be spread to those who are ready and interested to learn about Tom's model. And just through relationship and interaction, they get to learn about it. So that's a great vacancy right now. We're looking for many volunteers for that. So. And also, Carissa is here, who is part of the podcast uh, team, and also a really wonderful opportunity to uh, be a part of that support of that project and the time stamping project as well. The time stamping, uh, for many of you who are listening, have already been using this tool. And for those who haven't heard of this, this is a great opportunity to talk about a really tangible way that the, the volunteer community here has created an amazing tool. If you go to uh, my slash big slash toe.com, you'll see in the menu video search tool. And this is an amazing way to get into all of the YouTube content in a topic specific way. So for instance, if you're interested in guides and spiritual guides, how to interact with them, you can type that in. And all of Tom's YouTube content, thousands and thousands of hours, is organized into that topic in that tool. And so, uh, of course, Tom, you're releasing a lot of new content, usually at least one video a week or two. And so there's an ongoing need for uh, volunteers to be timestamping those new videos for the timestamping tool. And so uh, this, these are 
two great opportunities. We'd love to invite y'all to, to join in on. And there's others too, like if you're interested in translating or if you're interested in graphic design, we have needs around graphic design. There's so many opportunities based on your own interests and enthusiasm. That's really the whole point of this is the joy of service as well as connecting with one another and forming amazing relationships. So my closest friends are here. And so uh, it's been an absolute joy for me. And that's why it feels really exciting for me to invite you into this. This is something that I personally just absolutely love. And so you can write to mbtvolunteers at gmail.com if you are interested in pursuing this further. So that's enough uh, for me. And in just a moment, uh, uh, we'll be handing the, the stage over to Vanessa to give uh, a little orientation to how we're gonna do this Q&A and she'll be facilitating it. Before that, Tom, we wanted to give you the opportunity here to say whatever you like to open our time into the Q&A before handing it over to Vanessa. Okay, well, thank you, Nathan. Um, hopefully the words you just said will be part of the YouTube video that this will become. And you're asking for people to come join us We'll go out to many people, you know, hopefully there'll be thousands who will look at this. And so I appreciate you saying those things, Nathan, that that uh, will be helpful, not only to the people here, but mostly to the people who don't necessarily even know we exist yet. You know, what I'd like to say to everybody is, is uh, thank you so much for being volunteers, for giving your time and your, your effort, your expertise to MBT in order to help me and Pamela and Keith and Donna uh, get this material out to as many people as possible. We think that love is the answer is something that the rest of the world really needs to understand. Um, besides the, the, the better physics and more general physics, uh, the idea that we're here to get rid of our fear, to care, to you know, have empathy, concern, honesty, you know, it's the connection we have with others that's really the, the core of our, of our growth, of our evolution here. That's what's really important. And that, I believe, would help make this world a kinder, gentler place if more people understood that. And I am just one person and the, the four of us with Don and Keith and my wife, Pamela, you know, we've done what we can over the years, but that's pretty limited. You folks have done so much more, you know, like that that tool that we have and time stamping all those videos and and uh, the the group that uh, Michael Skansky has uh, that not only, you know, to go out like outreach and connect with people and let them know that MBT exists where that's appropriate, but also those people who bump into, let's say, the 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 videos, the YouTube videos, but they really don't know anything about MBT. So they have questions that to us would seem like really, really basic questions like, well, what does any of this have to do with love? You know, that sort of thing. Well, if they had read MBT or, you know, watched the videos, they'd know, but they don't. And that's an honest question. And there's a lot of other questions like that that are just, you know, um, the basic question that somebody would ask when they are new to it and really haven't read it, but we'd like them to be interested enough that they would go out and read it or watch the videos. And answering those questions will make a difference whether they just kind of, eh, sounds kind of goofy to me and then forget about it or whether they get interested and go on. So, you know, going over all those comments that come in with the videos is an important thing. There's lots of people there who, uh, if we could answer their questions, uh, would uh, maybe become more interested. So there's lots, of, uh, the, the, we need lots of people to help Michael. There's a lot to do in that, in that category of, of uh, uh, nudging, you know, the rest of the world toward at least exposing themselves to these concepts, whether they agree with them or disagree with them. But if we could at least expose them to them, I think that would help. It's a, it's really a process of making the, uh, you know, spreading by word of mouth a little more efficient. We make an effort to be that, you know, to, to represent that mouth, if you will, you know, in other forums, other places, and in answering questions and so on. So 
So that's good. And like you say, the other areas as well are all just, you know, as important. So we just couldn't do those sorts of things with just the four of us. If it wasn't for you folks, uh, the, we'd be much further behind than we are right now, as far as sharing this information with the rest of the world. So I really do thank you from the bottom of my heart for your, for your, you know, attention and your your willingness to put your time and effort. And everybody here is busy. Everybody here has a life and other things to do, and that you choose to spend some of it uh, helping. Uh, spread these words around it just it, uh, makes all the difference in the world so thank you and i'll be glad to answer whatever questions you have um, if they're personal questions it's probably be better to co to uh, um, express them in a way that's more general so that it's not just about you but so that lots of people could learn from it you know we talk about things in in a general way so that if this video goes out to tens of thousands of people, we want to we want to help as many of them. You know, so say things that that people uh, can relate to. And though often we feel like our problems are just ours, and nobody else in the world has ever had a problem just like ours, that's not true. Uh, when you discuss your problem, there's thousands of people out there that have something very similar, and they can identify with it very much. And that the discussion that we have. It's very helpful to them because it's on a, a subject that they, you know, have a very strong personal interest in. Well, okay, that's uh, about all I have for opening. Let's let Vanessa say a few words and then we'll just get on with the Q&A. Absolutely. Thank you, Tom. Uh, all right. So the Q&A, if anyone has a question, please feel free to put it in the chat and we will add you to the list. And if you don't wanna ask a question, you can always message me privately, I'll ask it for you. The first question we have is from Carissa. Carissa, go ahead. Thank you, Vanessa. Hi everyone, hi Tom, nice to be here today with all of you. Um, so this uh, question is kind of off the cuff here. It's just something that kind of has come up within the past couple hours that I thought was uh, relative to not only this fabulous group of volunteers, but for, um, everyone in general. And um, I wanted to talk about transitions, things ending, new things beginning, and that kind of murky, mucky waiting part in the middle uh, where you're kind of marinating and reorganizing and uh, thinking of new ways to expand and also contract, right? Some, some things need to end, some things uh, you know, need to make room for new things to begin. And I think that sometimes that's a difficult process because uh, it involves loss um, and the waiting, you know, the waiting around and the feeling that you have to kind of do something because there's there's this um, urgency culture in, you know, Western uh, society that I think we're slowly as a, a group trying to move away from. Um, but, you know, sometimes maybe you feel idle that there's something you should do um, in fact, I was talking to a group of friends over the weekend about this, about just kind of being and that it's okay to wait and flounder and, and wait for things to kind of come back together, you know, naturally without doing. Um, so I think, you know, I know from a volunteer group, from an administrative perspective, um, we're trying to, you know, kind of make some new systems and kind of out with the old and with the new ways of doing things. Um, and I know we've had some new facilitators that are, are coming up and some new, um, new responsibilities that people are taking. So from that perspective, and then also life in general, if we could hear your, your thoughts on that today. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, there's there's lots of answers to that, you know, lots of aspects to that, uh, what you've brought up. You know, one of them is that the trouble that we have and, and we struggle with these changes and we struggle with transitions from where we are to where we wanna be, uh, from one career to another, um, even in our personal lives, we struggle with relationships. And we have an idea where we'd like to be, but we don't know how to get there. And part of the problem is that those issues and problems that we struggle with are often problems and issues of our own making. We've created those issues. And we're not aware that we've created the issues. We've created them because of our 
fears that we have, because of our ego, because of the beliefs that we have. And in trying to outgrow them or transition beyond them, if all we do is change things in the outside world, in other words, rearrange, you know, uh, rearrange the furniture of our life, you know, change the outer world, then we're still carrying those, those same fears and those, those same, you know, that same ego and those same beliefs. And we just recreate not the identical problem because we'll have new, new furniture to hang it on. So it'll look different, but we'll create a similar problem just like it. And then we'll struggle with that. And then the struggles seem to go on forever. <laughs> like our life is just a constant string of struggling, struggling, struggling. And a lot of that is because we create it. We take it with us wherever we go. Whatever we have a new idea. Oh, OK, I've figured it out from now on. You know, I'm going to do this. But if you take all the dysfunction with you, eventually this, your new best idea, will also become a struggle. So we have to we have to look at who we are and what we are and where are our choices coming from? What's motivating us? Why do we want to change? Is it because we we find problems with ourselves and we're trying to grow up? Well, that's a good thing. Or is it because we find problems with the world and we just don't know how to change the world to be the way we want it to be? Well, that's something entirely different that changing the world to be the way we want it to be is just going to cause us more frustration, more struggle, because we can't change the world to be the way we want it to be. That won't happen. And even if we have some great point of leverage where we could change things in the world, let's say we had that leverage to do that, it probably wouldn't make a lot of difference because that would be fixing symptoms, not fixing problems. And when you fix symptoms, the problems just, you know, the symptoms just reappear in a little different guise. The only thing you can really change is you. So the first thing in transition is to realize the transition's about you. It's not about other people. It's just about you. And it's about who you are now and the dysfunction and issues that you have now and letting go of those to become someone else. Someone who doesn't have that much dysfunction, you know, has less dysfunction, let's put it that way. And that's what we, we focus on. It needs to be about us, not about the world. So when it comes to doing, what can I do? Well, that doing is almost always out in the world. You know, again, rearranging the furniture of our life. And that's not where the solution is. Basically, we need to change who we are, our choices, why we make the choices we make, our perspective. You know, we can create a whole new reality for ourselves just by changing our perspective. Once you change your perspective, the way you interpret reality changes, and therefore your reality changes. So if you want to change that reality out there, well, you change yourself in here. And then that reality out there will actually just change. It doesn't change so much as you're, the way you interpret it and the way you interact with it and the way you perceive it changes. You see? So something that was upsetting you and very annoying just doesn't upset you and doesn't annoy you anymore. It's still there, but now it's okay that it's there. You understand it, and now you actually can probably help it change itself. But as long as it's, it's about you trying to change other, then other will most always push back. That's just the nature of of uh, the way we are. And it's not just humans. Uh, you know, all entities are like that. You know, if you have a pet, you know, a cat or a dog, just put your hand up and on their side or front or back, any part on them, and just push them. And you'll see that instantly they'll push back. 
They don't think, oh, my person wants me to move over here, so let me just move over there. They don't do that. They instinctively just push back. That's their first thing. And humans are no different than that. So when you reach out to try to shuffle somebody around or push them or you know, uh, tell them that they're doing something wrong, they're just going to push back. And that will probably make it worse, not better. They'll go deeper into their dysfunction, trying to justify it, trying to, uh, in their mind, you know, you're wrong and you need to be rearranged. You need to be fixed. So doing isn't really the, the thing. Doing out in the world is not the thing. Doing inside. What can I do about me? Well, you have to really take that seriously. If you think that's about your behavior, then that won't help much either. That'll maybe make you act nicer, but it won't really help you grow up much. So it's not about your behavior. It's about who you are and what you are inside, your perspective, your attitudes, the way you feel, your reality. What is your reality like? Remember, your reality is your personal reality. And why is it like that? Is your reality not a happy place? Is there no peace and quiet and tranquility and satisfaction and warmth in your reality? Is it kind of cold and prickly and annoying and scary? Well, you've changed that from one to the other by changing yourself. So, Carissa, that's that's the, the thing about transitions, you know, we have to not not approach it intellectually. We in the Western culture want to solve all the problems with our intellect. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it and, you know, and then we'll be done. And that works fine if you're doing physical things. You know, you're building a shape with tinker toys or something. There's just a way to do it, and you do it, and when you're done, you're finished. But the inside world, the world of consciousness, does not work that way. You cannot apply your intellect and a recipe and a set of directions and end up changing anything at all about yourself. You have to really want to change who you are, not just change your behavior, and you have to want it enough that you actually do it. But the good news is, if you do want it enough, you will do it, even if you don't try. So just wanting to enough is pretty much all you need. That's that intent to change. And then you still can use your intellect. It's not that we our intellect isn't helpful. You can use that intellect, but use it to assess yourself. Assess your choices. Why do I make that choice? Why does this upset me? Why do I think this needs to change? Where is it going? What will that change do? How will that affect me? And, and if I change, how will that affect everybody else? These big picture thoughts. Our intellect is good at that, but that won't actually fix anything, but that'll maybe show us a path, something to, to do you know, about ourselves and about our choices. So that's... I guess, you know, there's a lot of different ways of looking at this thing about transitions and moving on and, and change and dealing with change. But mostly it's about changing us, our perspective and our attitudes. If we can do that, then we will always live in a peaceful, happy, you know, reality where we find satisfaction, a place where we can smile and interact with love. That's what that's what we'll find ourselves in. That's the kind of world we'll be in. Doesn't mean all the rest of the world has changed, but all we have to do is change ourselves. And we can find that space. Does that help, Carissa? It sure does. Uh, good stuff to marinate on. Change ourselves, change the world. <laughs> Got yeah, it. It's the Thank way it goes. Mm hmm. Beautiful. Thank you, Krista. Thank you, Tom. And next, we're moving over to Linda. Linda, you have a question. Uh, hi. So I haven't formulated my question that well, uh, but I've been marinating this question. <laughs> so a couple weekends ago, you and I 
participated in a fundraiser for some mutual friends because our mutual friends need money. And I'm not ashamed to admit I need money. And MBT events got hit hard by the pandemic. And um, I think they've lost some deposit money. It seems to me they need money. And I know you have a Patreon now, which is relatively new. Um, and you did your Kickstarter for the experiments and everything. So, you know, I'm not going to go around saying you need money, but it seems to me like you could use some money. <laughs> Couldn't, so, we, couldn't we all? So couldn't we all use some money? So my mm. question pertains to uh, the power of focused intent. And, you know, we talk a lot about using intention for healing physical ailments. Um, but I never really hear you encouraging mm. us to use intention to heal financial problems like poverty or lack. So the question is, can my intention be used to fix such a problem, a financial problem, or only health problems? No, it can be used to help uh, fix all sorts of problems, including, you know, <laughs> a need for more money. Uh, it can be used to, to fix all those. But what it does, if you have your intent focused on um, that you need more resources, then that focused intent will modify the probabilities to give you opportunities to do that. It's not just going to make your bank account grow for no apparent reason or a bundle of cash to be uh, found under the kitchen table. You know, it's not going to manifest like that. It's if you have that intent, you'll start getting opportunities. Now, what if you're closed to those opportunities and you don't see them? Well, those opportunities will just pass by and you won't get them. But if you continue to have that intent, more opportunities will pass by. You'll just get little nudges to do this or do that, and things will work out. Yes, you're right. Uh, MBT events lost a bunch of money. You know, I don't know what the what the totals are, but it's quite a lot of money. You know, sixty, seventy thousand dollars, that sort of stuff. Serious money when COVID hit, because we had a lot of events out there, brick and mortar events, not not the Zoom events, and we had put the down payments on those events, and a lot of that we couldn't get back. Some of it was because it was overseas; it was in Europe and other places in Asia. And they just when we said, Well, we can't come, could you give us our deposit back? It was just no. You know, and you know, it's in another country in another place, it's too hard to get it back. And it costs almost as much as what you'd get back just to pursue it legally. So you just kind of stuck when that happens. Uh, here, we were more successful in negotiating at least parts of it back. But the problem was, it's not that these people that we had events with were all very greedy, but they were also being hit hard by the same thing. You know, COVID is, was damaging their business. They're in the, the hotel and the you know, event business. And suddenly events weren't taking place because a bunch of people getting together someplace was not a good idea. So their business disappeared. And now we're asking them to give what little money that, you know, they do have in the bank to try to struggle on and, and still exist to give it back to us. And mostly it's not that they're greedy. They just couldn't, you know, they, they were also strapped to the nth degree. Some of those businesses disappeared. So that's, that was the problem. It's not that there's evil in the world that grabbed up our money is this was a hard time for everybody. And a lot of people lost money and a lot of people may have lost jobs and other things. It was an event that was we, you know, I say we was mostly Keith and Donna because they were the ones that, that do all the financing and the promoting and they, they did it with their money. And uh, yeah, they lost money and they're just beginning to dig themselves out of that, that hole that, that they were in. They're just beginning to see a little daylight at the end of it now. And we've got this, this attitude now that we're not going to other places brick and mortar anymore. We've got, uh, we had one in Poland, 
and that was going to be in October, but that got canceled because just when we were to our, we have to make a decision now because, you know, people who've bought tickets to go and, you know, doing all this stuff, you can't just a couple of weeks before the event tell them that the event's canceled. You have to give them a few months to, for them to settle out their stuff. So at that point, numbers were rising. We had a new variant going and it was, you know, everybody was, numbers were going up for sick people and dead people and everything was climbing. So at that point, we said we would not do that. We have one other one and that's Beamish Hall, which is a big get together, not really a talk, not, not me doing presentations. It's kind of, it's more of a big social event. It's kind of a big MBT party that we're having in, uh, in Britain. And that, uh, that will be this next year, I think in maybe March, something like that, the first part of uh, the next year. And after that, we're not traveling. Any events done will be done here locally because it's just too risky in these times. And then maybe things settle out, maybe, you know, we'll maybe change that. But so there aren't going to be any more of those sorts of events, but you're right. But we keep our, we keep our mind focused and we were struggling and, you know, Tom's Park popped out right about that time that we were at the bottom of that pile of, uh, of, you know, that hole that we were in financially. So that was good because that got launched and put out there and that went a long way, didn't solve the problem, but at least helped alleviate the problem that uh, Keith and Donna were having. So we gave them, you know, they're, they're getting half of all the proceeds of Tom's Park. Uh, no matter where it sells, whether it's, you know, YouTube or the thing that they did on the on the audio version or or whatever. So we split that with them. And you know, we have a lot of inflation. Pamela and I are retired. So, you know, inflation bites into people who have fixed incomes. So anyway, yeah, everybody's like that. I'm sure you're like that, too. Lynn. And so, you know, everyone could use a little extra income, make their life easier. But if you keep your mind focused on everything's going to be all right, everything's going to work out fine. We'll get through this, and and uh, life is good. It'll it'll find a way, and you have that positive attitude. Then that's what happens. Things work out. Opportunities present themselves. You know, it just works out. Now I don't think. Oh, I need more money. You know, focus on money. More money. That to me is not very productive and it's just not something I, I would do, but focus on everything's going to be okay. We're going to work, you know, it'll all work out. We'll get by. It may be some hardship, but we'll, we'll get through it. And that seems to always work. If you have that attitude, it may not be just money. It may be like the things that you folks do, you know, you just help move MBT to a larger audience because that helps not only share the, the ideas, but it creates revenue as well. So there's lots of ways that your life can improve besides just cash. And generally, I find that it we always get by. Things get tight, well, you just tighten your belt and you don't do things you used to do. You know, you don't eat out, you stay home, you don't go places, you, you, don't, uh, you don't spend the money that you don't have to, and that's okay because happiness and having fun don't depend on those things. It depends on relationships and connections. And you can do that whether you're going out or staying home. So it, uh, it all works out. But yes, definitely, if you have this intent that, uh, oh, I'm in a hard place right now. I really, uh, you know, uh, want some intent that this is gonna work out fine. This is gonna be, be okay. That will bring opportunities to you to make it okay. But you have to reach out and take those opportunities. It's, it's not wishing for a wad of money to, to appear on your kitchen table. That isn't, that is open. And if you put a, too much energy into that, it might happen in a way that was, that was not good. You know, somebody in your family might die and, and oh, leave you some money. But that's not the way you want to get money. You, know? you don't want it that way. Yeah. So you have to not just put 
energy into getting money, but into energy that everything will work and it'll work for everyone. You know, the boat will begin to float and we'll all do okay. And if life gets tough, well, that's okay. It's still happy. Relationships are still good. So indeed, we can put effort and intent into things working out positively and happily and nicely. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Awesome. Thank you. So now we're going to move over to Seabrand. Seabrand, you're up. Yes. Hi, Vanessa. Hi, Tom. It's, uh, <laughs> I've been listening and First, I thought my question will not tie or ties in better with the one before, but now it is floating into uh, this question also. Tommy, I, I have to tell you about uh, my last three months and my three units came into harmony, so to say. It's, uh, I have uh, this absolutely great experience now and my, I found my passion, I know what to do, I know exactly where I want to go, I know who I am, I, you know, everything came together in the last three months, and before that, I've, I've been a seeker so long, and it gives so much peace, and uh, it's such a wonderful experience, and that's why it ties in uh, nicely with uh, our conversation, because if you find your passion, and uh, I have to tell you about my IPOC. <laughs> it's my Individuated Project of Cycling. And that's my uh, project for uh, my volunteers project, if you want to call it. If, if, you, if, many, if you have your passion and you can use your passion to do a lot of other things, like in combination with the volunteers. And I have this whole plan and have my website will come out in the end of this month and I'll explain everything. But I, I wanted to talk to you about this phrase, Tom, and about metaphors. And um, it was in 2004, 10 years before I knew Tom Campbell, that I wrote this phrase down. And it's information is everything, everything is information. And I put it into my diary and it was, at that time, I was working in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, Hamid Karzai was first president of Afghanistan elected. I was head of security in, uh, in our embassy. And why do I tell you that? Is that I had to protect our ambassadors and our ministers and our uh, embassy was um, observing the elections. So my job was to get as much information as possible. That was my protection for Everybody else, it is information that is important. And in that time, I, it also sank into my awareness that it's not only in security, it is everywhere. I mean, <laughs> that's it. Information is in your life. Everything is information. And 10 years later, and through Bruce Lipton uh, with his uh, biology of beliefs, his epic uh, epigenetics. I saw an interview from you and uh, and Bruce together, and then I got into MBT, Tom. And um, for me, in all my search, the most important thing there was there was no dogma. I mean, that was my problem with 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 uh, my search, my spiritual search. And that was, uh, you know, there's, there, there's everywhere in, in religion, everywhere is dogma, but you presented it in, in, in a scientific way. And um, I learned from that, that, uh, that information that, that came in my awareness before that, that um, the metaphors are so important because if the metaphor of virtual reality or a virtual reality game wouldn't have been in our time, you couldn't have explained us the nature of our reality. You know, it is. And then I, I another big teacher or uh, influencer in my life is uh, also Neil Donald Walsh with his conversations of God. 
and I, I, I got that book after I got into MBT and I put things next to each other and, and everybody is saying the same thing. <laughs> Consciousness is fundamental. That's it. Bruce says it. Neil says it. Uh, you say it. Everybody. And that's where we have to start. And um, with my cycling project, I want to cycle around the world and make a vlog out of it. And spread the world, Tom, that consciousness is fundamental and, and make and, and try to meet new people, start new conversations. Uh, this is my passion and I can combine it now with a project. And uh, I told TT about it and I will, like I said, made his website. But I found another metaphor that was interesting because you always say, love yourself is narcissism kind of thing. And in conversations with God, they say, yeah, selfishness means self-awareness. And in that concept of self-awareness, you can, you know, not self-awareness of your body, but self-awareness of yourself. And that is our IUOC, right? I mean, you say the same thing. It's just that some of the metaphors bring you into a, a different uh, meaning. I mean, uh, there are more things like in the conversations of God, he says, we all, all we have to do is remember. And you say more, well, we have to learn, you know, we lower our entropy by learning and by, by experience. But if you think about it a little bit further, then yes, uh, you, you really say the same too, because we are part of the LCS. We are IUOCs. We, <laughs> we are immortal, for God's sake. I mean, and we are growing to... Uh, love. I mean, in the big picture, there are no there are no problems. And if you live in out the big picture, and all the problems in the small picture kind of disappear there. And um, so, uh, sorry about this uh, long uh, conversation I have here, Tom. But what I wanted to point out and to put Bruce Lipton and and Neil Donald Walsh and you next to each other, you all say the same. But it's just kind of you use kind of the different metaphors and that mm -hmm. virtual reality is something that we needed in this time to explain the nature of our reality. That's why Albert Einstein couldn't explain it and, and Wheeler because they didn't have the, the right metaphor. Mm -hmm. Are you agreeing, Tom? Is that, yeah, uh, absolutely. That's the way it is. And it's not just the three that you name, but, you know, a hundred others that are like that too, yes. that, yes. Uh, you know, if you look at their words, you realize that, and, yeah. that the, the metaphors are different, but basically, fundamentally, we're all saying the same thing, which is good. That's good. And the more people we can get to think that way, the closer we are to solving our problems. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I see that same way. And the, the, the thing is that I have this urge now also, and, and the time is exactly right, you know, I mean, it's true that if you live your passion, if you live in the, I came to the realization, Tom, if we, we live in the internal now, right? Uh, I mean, and if you make every second, every microsecond in, in the now valuable, then you're there. That's all you have to do <laughs> to be aware that we always in the now. I mean, and if you make that now valuable and, and are aware of this now, then you can't go wrong if you have the big picture in mind. I mean, that's that's where I get all my comfort. I mean, my God, I'm immortal. What are my worries? There are no worries. But playing this great game, and 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 it's true. The the, the LCS supports you. He nudged me through all these three months. I was doing my test drive through the mountains on my bicycle with my equipment. I test my avatar. Can I still do it? And. You know, I, I want to go to the mountains in Nepal. Uh, can I? Can my body still do it? I'm 63 now, but thank God I always uh, been uh, keeping my avatar fit, and I love to do it. I I just love to do it. And and then I decided after these three months, okay, this is it. You speak up now. You make your website. You make your videos. You you talk to the volunteers. I really want to you know, do something and spread the word and consciousness is fundamental. That's in my website. That's, that's, that's where it's all about. And for your wisdom. And yeah, welcome. life is great for me at the moment. It's at the moment, it's just 
I'm in a little bit of a cloud at the moment. <laughs> and it's wonderful. It is really wonderful. Live your passion. That is all I can say. That will jump you into a state of happiness. Okay. Well, good luck with, with all of that. I hope that uh, works works well for you and keep us posted on you. If you take that trip, you know, let us, let us know, let us know how that's going. We'll do. Cool. Yeah. We'll, uh, we have a whole plan around it, but uh, like I said, uh, in the coming months, I will present it on Slack and through volunteers. I already talked to Titi about mm -hmm. it uh, a little bit and we'll see how we can yeah. give it uh, a good form. Okay. Okay. Thanks Tom for, uh, mm -hmm. for your time. Mm -hmm. Exciting. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Yvette. That sounds like exciting adventures ahead. Can't wait to live vicariously through you. <laughs> um, next, we're going to move it over to Marco. Marco. Hello. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, hi, Tom. Hi, everyone in the MBT volunteer community. So uh, the question I have is related to what I think is um, misunderstanding, not only potentially in the MBT community, but also in the people that is, are involved into spiritual uh, communities or people that have a spiritual focus. And that's uh, related to if the, to the dichotomy that goes like this. If I am spiritual, then I don't get to be involved into politics. Um, and why I think that's a misunderstanding because um, to build things together, it requires politics. And usually we take it in the, in the wrong sense, politics as something that is dirty. But there, there is also the flip side, uh, which is building things together and improve our communities. And you know, like mm -hmm. getting involved um, is important for building community, uh, community parks, for example, or for protecting the environment right now. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. That's important. Uh, so if you would like to um, say a comment on that, and prior to your comment, I, I would like to read something from your from the uh, MBT wiki. And that is from the biography section, uh, your biography. And this is just a, a, a small sentence. It says, while an undergraduate, Tom became the president of his fraternity and chief justice of the college students, student court. So could you please share with us uh, something about, you know, getting involved <laughs> and um, uh, having a word and, and a stand into, you know, politics and how sure. they Sure, sure. Yeah, well, Marco, you're, you're, you're quite right to say that this is a a misconception that is in the spiritual community uh, widely. And that is that when you let go of your fear and, and your ego and your beliefs that you kind of then float up above the crowd, you're no longer part of that uh, mass of people out there who are struggling and fighting with each other and so on. You kind of transcend that and then you float above it all and don't really touch it or participate with it or connect to it you transcend it instead and you are correct that is not a good attitude our you know our growth here has a lot to do with our involvement with our connection with relationships with how we connect to other people it's not just about us if it was just about us well we could just work on our you know getting rid of our fear and transcend out of this messy place and stay in our own little co happy cocoon and not interact with anybody who didn't bring us joy. Well, that basically means we'd be building ourselves a castle, you know, pulling up the drawbridge and only letting in the people that make us happy and then live that way. Well, you could probably uh, insulate yourself from a lot of dysfunction that way but you're not going to be very helpful. You're not really going to be part of the solution. Well, you might be, but it would be a small contribution to being part of the solution. You need to be as big a part of the solution to our problems as you can and grow up at the same time. So 
becoming more spiritual, growing up, requires you to stay connected, not transcend and drift off into your own little private happy space. It's it's what you, you know, it's what you can give back, how you can help the rest of the world. Now, no, you can't change the rest of the world, but you can be a good, um, you know, you can be a, a, what's the word I'm thinking for? You can be a, a, you can lead them. Good example is what I was looking for. You can be a good example. And by walling yourself off in your, in your tower, you're not being a good example. Matter of fact, you're basically saying, you people are so dysfunctional, I just can't live with you. I'm going to go get in my little tower and get away from you. And then my life at least will be functional. And you can all just go to hell, you know, in a handbasket if you want. I really don't care. You know, not my problem. It's all about me. You see, that's not really spiritual. That's a lot of ego. That's a lot of ego where you put yourself above other people. And you're above them and better than them and don't want to interact with them. If you're really going to contribute to this world becoming a better place, you have to get out and interact with people. No, you don't go out to change people, but you interact with them. Give them a good example. What, what's it like to be around somebody who actually has their act together and is happy and confident and uh, full of love and caring? Well, those people attract people to them. Much better to to be that example than it is to, you know, be transcended into your own little heaven someplace and, and withdraw from the rest of the world. So absolutely, you have to be a part of what's going on. And politics is the way we is is the way we uh, create rules of interaction for ourselves. If you live alone on an island, then you can do whatever you please whenever you please, because you're the only thing there. Now get one other person on that island with you. And that's no longer true. Now you need to be considerate and caring of that other person. The choices you make are now constrained because another person is there. And you need to take their well being into consideration as well. And now there are 10 people there, or 100 people, or 1,000, or what do we have on this planet? Almost 8 billion people there. And we can't just do what we please whenever we please. What we do affects everybody else. And we have to be aware of that connection. And we then codify these rules that we have of how we can act within you know, a group of people can interact without us running over each other's free will. And that becomes our law, that becomes our culture, that becomes our rules of, of living. All of that's important. If you, if you go off to be in your own little private castle and, and see yourself as above the fray, then you, you withdraw your ability to be part of the solution, to help. So yes, you're right. Politics, you know, volunteering for like you, you're all volunteers, you know, putting your time into this thing. That's exactly what you're doing. You're putting your time into places you think matter. And that's what you need to do. You know, if all of the people just went off and found their own little private uh, castle to live in, then there wouldn't be any volunteers here at MBT. So you're right, it's a it's a misnomer that a spiritual life sets us apart and and gets us out of the of the everyday push and tumble and 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 you know struggle that we have. We're part of that struggle and we need to stay a part of it. But we need to be a part that's a shining light and a good example to everybody else. So that's that's uh, real spiritual development is not taking yourself out of the picture, but putting yourself into the picture in as most helpful way as you can. Connect, you know, not only with the people you agree with, but connect with the people you disagree with.
They need good examples too. But do that in a way, not that you go preaching, oh, all you people, I disagree with you. That means you're all wrong. You know, that's not helpful. All that does is make everything worse. That's very self-centered, and that's not grown up. So as you do grow up, you realize how you have to interact with people to be helpful to them. So you give them an incentive to take the next step in a positive direction, not by lecturing them, but just by being a good example, giving them information they can use, helping them see bigger pictures, being kind to them, considerate, listening to them. You see, that's how you become a person of interest to them, and therefore it's possible for you to help them. As long as you're somebody that's on the other side, they're not going to listen to anything you say. Yeah, I, also think, I also think that it's a misunderstanding. Like, uh, if you go to the or the other group, or you know, the group that you are supposed to be against, uh, you are often often regarded as, you know, a traitor or somebody that <laughs> that um, doesn't belong to our group because mm -hmm. you know you are going to to get involved into the other group. So that's an, uh, often a, another misunderstanding. Yeah. Yeah, well, Things that's, cannot change otherwise. Yeah, but you can't change things easily from the outside. If you talk about an organization, a group, or an idea, or anything, trying to change it from the outside just doesn't work. Again, you're the one now that's pushing. You're the, you're the hand against the side of the dog. You're pushing that group that, you know, I want you to change and be this way. And they push back and they become less that way. They become more the way they are. They double down on their, on, on, you know, on their beliefs. So if you want to change something, it's much easier to change it from the inside than it is from the outside. Now, from the outside, you can put pressure on things, you know, you can go out and march and put your signs up and try to sway public opinion, you know, to your side. And all that is, is, you know, good things to do. You can become part of movements. And it's not that that's a wrong thing to do. That's education. You're trying to help people see things from a different viewpoint. But it has to be positive. You can't go running through a neighborhood breaking windows and thinking that you're going to raise the, you know, the quality of consciousness throughout the world, you know, that doesn't work that way. You can't go p calling people names and shaking your fist at them and calling them stupid isn't going to help. So, yes, if you really want to change something, get inside of it and start advocating for change. Because until you become an insider, none of that, nobody in that group is going to listen to anything you say nor give it any consideration. Right. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, thank you, Tom. That, I have so much to say around that. <laughs> but um, I know Aaron has a question. Aaron, before we go over to you, though, I do want to just quickly comment. Um, that's such a great question that you had, Marco, because my whole life I've been like, ah, politics, politics, and I haven't been interested in politics. And I've always been more interested mm -hmm. in the big picture and spirituality and trying to understand my purpose here. And after coming across my big toe, mm -hmm. after about five years of it, and finally feeling like now I understand my purpose, now that I get my purpose and I know I'm here to engage and interact, I'm so interested in politics. Like I just spent the weekend with my friend who's running for mayor. She was two time city councilor. And I'm like, yeah, we need to help. We got to like get involved. Um, so it's interesting how, yeah, how that switches. Yeah. Once you, once yeah. Well, it's a, it's a thing that you develop, you know, you do have to develop yourself first. You know, if you just, if you're not very grown up, then you're not going to be very helpful to give anybody else an example to grow up. So the first thing is you have to, get yourself grown up to the point that you can be helpful, inspirational. Uh, you can connect with other people in a way that they listen to you. You know, if you're not grown up, then you can't do that very well. So it takes both. And some of the time you'll be, you'll spend just on yourself growing up, looking at your fears, dealing with them. And then other times you'll go join a, you know, political, you know, event and, and volunteer for it and work hard at it. 
So your life can have all of that in it. And you can't do everything at the same time. But the key, you're more grown up. So you should always spend some time on getting rid of your fear and seeing bigger pictures. That should be going on all the time. But then besides that, you can go out and volunteer and get involved and connect. And, you know, I, I've, Pete, I'm you know, speaking to the choir here. I mean, all of you have, have come and volunteered. So you're already doing that. But you work on yourself as well. Um, okay, so we're going to turn it over to our youngest member, 12 years old, just turned 12. Aaron, over to you, Aaron. Uh, thanks, Vanessa. Okay, so, uh, hi, so kind of a personal question. Whenever I'm sad, I think of this. So if everyone becomes rich, uh, the currency would have no value. The current, the value of currency is given by the goods and services in the nation. So total goods plus services is equal to the relative value of money. Um, and there, and in some shows, there can't be like good guys without bad guys, right? So I've come to the conclusion that you can't really comprehend true happiness without experiencing like true pain. And, uh, but then you can't feel true pain without feeling true happiness. So I feel like there's a barrier here. Um, can you unlock like ultimate peace without infinite suffering? Is there truly balance within like one whole equal unit that everything's the same and it's technically balanced or like repelling fractions, north, south, uh, dark, light, um, the opposites, but still balanced enough to come to the um, like a, a middle point. Like if zero is balanced, how do you achieve it? Zero plus mm -hmm. zero or negative two plus two? Okay. Uh, it's not true that everything must be in balance, that for positive things to exist, negative things have to exist to the same degree. So if you have a whole lot of positiveness, then you need a whole lot of negativeness to balance that. That is just false. That's not the case. That is not necessary. Now, things have their opposites, but those opposites do not have to be in equal amounts. Okay, so yes, happiness defines not being happy, right? If we, we define anything, then we can put a not in front of that and it defines the opposite. But you can grow up and find in your life happiness, satisfaction, contentment, and everything positive. And that doesn't mean that you have to go through as much misery or that somebody else has to be having that misery in order for you to have your happiness. The world just doesn't work like that. Basically, we get to, you know, create positivity and happiness depending on our attitudes, depending on how we see things, depending on our understanding, um, depending on how much fear we have or don't have, depending on how, what kind of beliefs we have or don't have. So we can create a positive world. It doesn't have to have a big negative part to counterbalance that. It's just, you know, some philosophy feels that way. You have to have evil in order to have good. And if there's good, then there must be evil. Not true. There can just be good. There doesn't have to be evil. Now, the concept of evil will be there because that's the not good. That's the high entropy. But you don't have to manifest that into being an action and people being that way. That's not required. Everybody could be happy. Everybody could be positive, And that's perfectly all right. And we still understand that that there is an opposite to things, but we don't have to, to manifest that opposite. We just know that it's there. So this uh, balance that you're talking about is not an actual thing that has to happen. Now, there are some systems that need to be balanced, like your checkbook. <laughs> you, know, you need to balance that. Uh, the economy, as you say, you know, that uh, is the way economies work. There's a certain balance occurs. If you have a higher demand, then basically prices go up. If 
you have a, a, a supply that's dwindling and it's a, an item that has high demand, but, but the supply, then you're going to have prices go up. And these are just, these things balance out. But that's an economic system. That's not a consciousness system. We're consciousness and we can be as negative and unhappy and miserable as we like because we have free will and we can be as happy and full of joy and caring as we like because we have free will. And there is no requirement to have as many miserable people as there are happy people because that's not the way this system works. Everybody can be miserable and everybody can be happy and it's just, uh, you know, the more miserable people you have together, then they tend to make other people miserable too. The more happy people you have together, they tend to make people who come into that group happier as well. And it's our job to grow up to the point where we sow happiness, peace, and, and uh, satisfaction in the world rather than sow the opposite. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Aaron, did that answer your question about what you were looking for? Yeah. Yep. yeah. Okay, great. All right. So let's move over to Michael. Michael. Great. <clears throat> I had forgotten what my question was, but um, Aaron <laughs> kind of reminded me what it was. So uh, it's kind of related. So it's, that's good. Um, <laughs> it's, um, it's related to what he was saying. Uh, there's a famous poem by Khalil Gibran called On Joy and Sorrow. And um, you can look it up to read the whole thing if you're curious, but it talks about um, how kind of joy and sorrow are uh, inseparable, how you kind of need one to have the other. There's one line in particular that says, the deeper that sorrow, sorrow carves into your being, the more joy you can contain. And I've um, kind of found this to be true in my life, in my experience that, uh, you know, you kind of need to have some of the negative sometimes to really kind of experience the positive side. And I feel like that kind of goes against what you were just saying with, you know, how you don't need to always have both in balance or, you, you know, you want to be as loving as possible but i feel like there's some truth to what khalil is saying in the poem about how you know that that negative can kind of enrich the positive side of it or something like that. What, right. do you, what do you say about that well there is a connection between the two and that's the connection that uh, we'll use the metaphor you know the the carrot and the stick if you're trying to teach a donkey to <laughs> go when you want them to go and stop when you want them to stop then or anything else then there's the carrot which is the metaphor for a positive reinforcement for the behavior you want and then there's the stick which is a negative um you know a, a negative enhancer for when something negative happens so if you want to treat teach a puppy to you know go outside to to go to the bathroom then you can do it two ways you can do it with positive reinforcement and you will reward them for success. And there's negative reinforcement, which means you punish them when there's failure. Okay, so that's the carrot and the stick metaphor. So life works that way in that if you're not grown up and you have negativity, you have fear and ego and beliefs, then you create dysfunction. You create negative things. You create suffering for yourself. And that's the stick. You create problems. As you grow up, life becomes better. It becomes happier. You smile more. You're more satisfied. That's the positive side. And that's the carrot. So which would you rather have? You'd rather have more positive. But you need some incentive to work toward that. And that stick is your incentive. You want to avoid that stick. You don't want to get slapped by that stick. So you try to work toward the positive. So those, the two interact with each other. We are who we are, and we have negative and positive within us. That negative is our, you know, is the stick. When we get to the point that we say, oh, life just is, sucks. It's so terrible. It's awful. You know, my, you know, life is a terrible, a terrible thing here. I don't want to be here anymore. Well, what are you going to do about that? 
self-pity, you know, you could all sit around and feel sorry for yourself, and that'll just make it worse. And it'll continue to get worse as long as you continue to be negative. And once you find something that's positive, it'll start to get less worse. And then you find more positive and it'll It'll keep getting better as you find more positive things in your mind. So that's the way our life works. Yes, we have to deal with the negative. But once we understand our reality and how it works, it becomes a lot easier. We become a lot more, what, cogent. We become, we understand it. In other words, if you have your your donkey you're trying to train and, and all you do is feed it carrots and smack it and it can't understand what any of it's for all it knows is sometimes it gets a carrot and sometimes it gets slapped but it doesn't know and it can't figure it, it out well then it's kind of lost and that's the way most people are they don't really understand reality enough to realize what we're supposed to be doing here but once you realize the stick and what the cause of that stick is, that's you. That's your fear. That's your stick. It slaps you and causes you to be unhappy, miserable, sad, self-pity. And then there's the carrot, which is your positive side, your love, other people, relationships, caring. And if, when you understand how it works, it's so much easier to move toward the carrot and avoid the stick. All you have to do is grow up change who you are. For people who aren't aware, it's just confusing. Sometimes there's joyful moments and then, there, then you get slapped and it seems like you can't, you can't get away from them. That's where this idea is that you need equal balances of negative and positive because you feel like you just can't get away from it because you don't really understand what constitutes the stick, your fear, and what constitutes the carrot, your love. So that's the relationship between them. And some people need a very, a very heavy handed stick in order to wake them up. What do they call that? The, the dark night of the soul kind of thing where you descend and descend and descend into self pity and misery until you just hit bottom and can't go any deeper. And then you bounce back and start climbing back up out of that hole with positivity. So there is a connection, but I would say that uh, the idea that you need both is wrong. You don't need to be hit with a stick ever. You don't need it in the sense that, that uh, it's something you should experience. It's something you do experience because you can't avoid it because you're, you have fear. So, you know, there's another saying that says you always get what you need and deserve. And that means in order to grow, in order to grow up, you get the things you need and deserve. And if what you need is sticks, you get sticks. So there's just, I'm, I'm looking at it now from different ways, using different language, because, you know, we can talk about it with different kinds of metaphors. So it's not the words that are so important, it's, it's the meaning, it's the metaphor that you're using that make, gives that word meaning. Yeah, I guess what I interpret his poem or his metaphor is, and he's, he's saying that, you know, the deeper you kind of dig that hole over time, which you may have done, you know, inadvertently not knowing what you were doing, I guess, um, when you do kind of climb out of it, the, there's like a a deeper sense of joy because you're, I guess, maybe have more of a difference where you're kind of really climbing out and that yeah. you can really feel that um, yeah. Yeah, difference. Yeah, it could be the, the that turnaround, that final, you know, understanding, or it could even call it an enlightenment, you know, that uh, your misery is self-created and that you can climb out of it. And it is something that you can do. But that's what most people feel, but it's not necessary. We all don't have to start with being miserable. You don't need to start there. It's not like everybody has to be super miserable before they can be happy. Not the case. It just depends how long it takes you to understand, you know, what your stick is and, and you know, and what your carrot is and, and to figure that whole thing out and start moving to the positive. And some people never have a lot of 
turmoil or a lot of negativity or a lot of pain in their life. They just don't have a lot of that. You don't have to be miserable in order to be happy. That's not necessary. People have been around this incarnation cycle many, many, many times who have grown and, and lowered their entropy. They don't have to be miserable here first. Yes, they come in and they have to make choices, but basically they start off making pretty good choices. And they have a kind of a, a positive perspective. They see bigger pictures quicker and sooner than others who have not lowered their entropy so much. So they escape most of that negativity and they'll look back at their whole life and they'll say, oh, okay, there were some hard times, but yeah, we got through those and they were fine. And I never felt very bad or, or uh, upset about really anything in my life for more than you know a few hours maybe. So that does happen. You don't have to be miserable to be happy, but being miserable, Getting to that dark night of the soul can be the thing that turns you around and moves you the other direction. But whenever you figure out what reality is about, and that is about, you know, the stick is your own fear. Well, things start should start getting better from that from that realization. Yeah, that's great. So yeah, it's good to hear. <laughs> I thought I thought you would say something like that. But I always found that poem to really resonate with me. And I was Yeah. It's nice to see the contrast. Yeah. Well, I think people get into this idea that you have to be miserable. You know, there has to be enough, as much uh, misery as there is uh, a joy, because that justifies their being miserable. You see, that's a, a justification. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people are miserable. Most people have a lot of fear. So most people are unhappy and have a lot of misery. And if they say, well, that's just life, you know, life, you know, is, is full of, uh, uh, you know, sorrow. Life is just full of hardship and misery and pain. And that's the way it is. There's no way to escape it. It's just the human, you know, it's just human to, to have that as your experience. No, it isn't human to have that as your experience. You can avoid that altogether if you're grown up enough. But it is, in general, it is typical it's our average experience. Most people do experience a lot of pain and suffering and angst and misery and stress and all that stuff in their life. All that negative stuff is and has been a major part of their life and will continue to be a major part of their life. But that doesn't make it necessary. And it's not just because you're human and it's not part of the human condition. It's part of the fact that humans have a lot of fear. That's what it's about. And fear is not necessary. You can get rid of that fear. You can outgrow it. Thanks, Tom. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Great question, Michael. And it is interesting because a lot of people, myself included, you know, we go through so much drama and, we're, and afterwards we're like, oh, I needed that to happen because it taught me this valuable lesson. If it didn't happen, I would have never learned this lesson. But Tom, what you're saying is like, no, it doesn't have to be so dramatic. You can learn peacefully. <laughs> yeah, so it depends on how how quickly you learn. You know, some people hit themselves, you know, with a hammer once and they say, gee, that hurts. I, I wonder what happened. And they do it again and again and again and again. And after they've made the same error, the same mistake, caused the same pain, you know, 50 times, a light bulb goes on and says, well, maybe I should stop doing that. And then they think for better ways. And other people cause themselves pain one time and figure it right out and said, oh, that was a bad choice. Mm -hmm. And they change themselves. So it just depends on how slow you are to grasp what's going on. So if you went through a horrible space and you go back and says, well, I needed that. Well, you probably did from where you were with the fear you had. You know, you needed something to push you into a more positive space. So, but it's not, it doesn't mean that you couldn't have done it more quickly. You couldn't have seen, you know, what was wrong and how you needed to change and why your choice wasn't good, that you could have seen the fear more easily. You could have perhaps, but you didn't because you are who you are. So everybody has to go down their own path in their own way in their own time. And yes, we look back and we see how we've grown. And we realize that you couldn't be where you are now if you hadn't been where you were then.
It's all part of our path. Every choice we've made in our entire life leads us to where we are right now. We are the sum of our choices.